Romans chapter 5. Let's go ahead and jump right in. Verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So first off, whenever we see a section, or in this case, a chapter that starts with the words, therefore, we have to ask ourselves, what's it there for? Therefore is a qualified or a building statement, meaning that it is building on the foundation that was discussed before. So everything said after is what's building on that foundation. The previous foundation was Romans chapter 4, which Pastor Jerry covered last week. So if you weren't here, I encourage you to check it out. It's definitely worth it. But Paul talked about the difference between works and faith in chapter 4. We are saved by faith only, not by works. Now this verse says we're justified. As a refresher, that means we're made right or declared innocent in a legal sense before God. And we have peace with God. So if anybody was here on Sunday for Pastor Doug's message, you heard him use the same Greek word for peace. It's called irene. And as he discussed, it means to join or bring together. It also means harmony with emphasis on a lack of strife. So before Jesus, we were enemies of God because of our sins. We were separated Because of Jesus, we have peace with God. He has brought us together. We have harmony with God, and there is no strife. And this is only through Jesus. So upon accepting Jesus, we have eternal peace with God. The power of sin is broken, and we no longer live under the fear of judgment. And that's an awesome thing. But what happens when we sin? Because we all sin. Do we still have the peace of God? The answer is yes and no, and I'll explain. In the eternal sense, in regards to, if you want to say, being on God's good list, yes, we still have the peace of God. We still have consequences when we sin, as actions always have consequences, but it does not change our relational position to God. If we continue to commit the same sin, God will not give us peace in our life, but that does not mean that We're going along and we are right with God. We have peace and then we sin and that peace is taken away and now we're enemies of God again and we got to hurry up and repent and then we're not enemies again. It doesn't mean that. It means God will not let us rest or have comfort. We'll be agitated and that's because God wants to get us back on track with his will. Hebrews 12, five and six. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, Do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son he receives. God will discipline us when we sin because he wants what's best for us. He has a perfect will for our lives, and if we get caught up in sin, that keeps us from that. Now, this does not mean that God is in heaven holding a club, watching and just waiting for you to step out of line and sin so he can whack you over the head. He knows that we will stumble and fall. What he wants is for us to get back up and continue walking with him. We will still struggle with sin, but as we walk with God, we'll sin less. We still have battles with sin, but God has already won the war. Verse 2. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So through faith in Christ, we have access to God. We have his grace and can stand before God. We have fellowship and a relationship with a loving heavenly father. Paul says we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So we are looking forward to and expecting holiness righteousness, purity, light, incredible love. What this is saying is we'll be surrounded by that and a part of that. Imagine if you were suddenly adopted by the king of another country. You would leave behind the limitations that define your current life and you would embrace the freedom, the luxury, the experience of being a child of the king. That is what has happened with us. But the challenge is that we are not able to physically move into that kingdom. So 
Some theologians will call that the already and not yet, meaning God has already done the work. Christ died for us, but we are not yet walking in God's eternal kingdom. That can be frustrating, obviously. Philippians 1.6, and I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So don't be discouraged that God's perfect kingdom seems so far away or that you yourself seem so far from what you think God wants you to be. He always does what he says he will do, so you can trust him on that. Verse three, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. So in this next section, Paul is shifting his message a little bit. We're going from talking about the glorious blessings of peace with God to talking about suffering. And it's not really a topic that's fun because I think personally I would much rather keep talking about the peace of God. That's a more happy place. But the truth is we experience suffering. As I said, we're, we've been adopted into God's kingdom, but we're still in this world. This fallen world is broken by sin. And on top of that, when we accept Christ, when we become part of God's family, we suddenly have an enemy that is out to destroy us. 1 Peter 5.8. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. That someone is you. The devil wants to take you out. God loves you, so Satan hates you. Now, I don't know if you've ever watched a nature documentary, but lion attacks are not known for being fun or mild or harmless. So this means we are going to have suffering in this world. But what Paul is getting at in this next section is encouraging us because our suffering is not pointless. God will bring good out of it. I'm sure some of you are familiar with this verse, Romans 8, 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. We all know and love that scriptures. We see it on Christian memorabilia all the time. But sometimes we forget the part that means we have to go through something that is unpleasant or bad for God to bring the good out of it. We also see here that Paul is saying suffering helps us grow. It produces fruit within us. Now this fruit is not just for us. It's for everyone in our lives and everyone we come into contact with. So let's look back at verse three again. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. It's Greek word time again. So the Greek word for endurance here is hyponame, and it can be translated as patience, perseverance, or simply patience. So who here has ever done something they regret because they were impatient? Anybody? I, th I think we could probably all raise our hand. Or been involved in a situation that escalated because someone was impatient. We've been there. How many people think that maybe being more patient would be beneficial to their life? Or what about the people in your life? Do you think you being more patient would help them? Or are they sitting next to you going, he or she needs to be more patient? The truth is we could all use more patience. Verse 4. And endurance produces character, and character produces hope. So after patience, this leads to character. Now, if you've been called a character, that does not mean that you automatically have patience. Being called a character is something completely different, and I think that might be a, a different sermon altogether. The Greek word here we're talking about is dokime, and it literally means proven character or tested character. So think of a blacksmith with metal. He's hammering it. He's tempering it, which means he's heating it up. That process makes it stronger and tougher. Now this leads to hope, which is elpis in Greek. This means expectation, trust, and confidence. Verse five. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So if we look back at those verses and those fruits and we put them all together, this is what it says. Suffering will give us patient perseverance with proven strength 
and trusted confidence that does not put us to shame. So those are good benefits. And as we are refined going through trials in life, and those begin to manifest in our lives, they will begin to benefit others in our lives. And a byproduct of that is it makes future trials and sufferings more bearable for us because we know that God was faithful in the previous ones. Now, we are not put to shame through these sufferings and trials because the Holy Spirit is within us, pointing us to God. There's a saying, and you may have heard it, if God brings you to it, he will bring you through it. God gets us through it, and not only that, but he gives us the opportunity to come through it as a better version of ourselves and closer to him. For me, I think that takes the teeth out of that roaring lion's attack. Verse six, while we were still sinners, I'm sorry, for while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Got ahead of myself there. So weak here means helpless. We were completely vulnerable at this time. There was nothing we could do for ourselves. So a word picture would be, imagine a cage match. In this corner, you've got a grizzly bear. Facing off against that grizzly bear is an infant. That infant would be able to do nothing. It would be completely at the mercy of the grizzly bear. And that was us with our sin. Now that verse says, at the right time. It may seem late or later than we'd like, but even at the 11th hour, God's timing is always perfect. Let's look at Galatians 4, 5, and 6. To redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into your hearts crying, Abba, Father. You know what? I think I must have given you the wrong verse there. Um, Because that's a great verse, but that's not what I was saying. Uh, The verse I had was... uh, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoptions as sons. So this is a reminder that we can always trust God's timing, especially when it doesn't line up with what we think that timing should be. Don't let the devil lie to you. God never forgets your situations or the things you're facing. He never overlooks anything. He sees all and knows all, and his timing is perfect. Now, back to the end of verse 6, ungodly refers to all who have sinned and missed God's mark. Who is that? We covered that the last time I was up here, Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's pretty short, pretty concise. It means everyone, all people, Jew and Gentile alike. Verse 7. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So Paul is kind of stating an obvious truth here. People may agree with the plight of someone facing punishment or even death, but it's rare that we would offer to trade places. I'm sure you can think of some situation where somebody has been wronged, and I'm not bringing up current events by any means, but you might say that's wrong, but nobody is volunteering to say, I'll switch places with them. Paul is contrasting our innate human selfishness with God's selflessness. We may die for a good person, maybe, in the rare occasion, But Jesus died for the worst people. He died for you. He died for me. He died for all of us. And at the moment that he made that sacrifice, he saw each and every one of our sins, all of them, all at once. In short, Jesus saw us at our very worst. When we were defiantly sinning with zero remorse, he paid the ultimate price for us. That's love. Verse 9. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. So, as we discussed previously, there's that phrase, therefore, Paul has mentioned, and he's he's bringing it up again. We've been declared innocent because of Jesus' blood. We're no longer under judgment, and we will not face God's wrath. So, what does that mean? What does that look like? Well, Revelation 6, 12 
through 17 gives us a snapshot of that. When he opened the sixth seal, I looked, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth. The full moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth, and the great ones, and the generals, and the rich, and the powerful, and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? That sounds terrifying, and it will be for those without Christ. And one thing that always jumped out at me about this verse is, as at the end when it says that that everyone is hiding in caves or under rocks, they know whose wrath they're facing. They know what they've done. There are no more excuses. There's no more pandering. They're just trying to get out of it, but they know. Now, even more terrifying than that is what follows next, the judgment. Revelation 20, 14 and 15. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. That's a bad place to be. But thanks be to Jesus, he paid our debt, and we do not have to fear that. Amen. That's worth clapping over. Verse 10. For while we were enemies, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Jesus willingly died and rose again for his enemies, so his enemies could willingly become part of his family. God's family will be together in heaven for eternity. Those who refuse to be a part of God's family by rejecting Jesus and his free gift we'll have the second death, the lake of fire, to look forward to. Verse 11. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received reconciliation. God is glorified through Christ's obedience, which which led to our salvation and our reconciliation to God. It was his plan, and through it we can come into God's presence. We will have fellowship with God for eternity. That's just an incredible concept to wrap our minds around. Now we're getting ready to go into a new section here, and Paul is shifting gears again. Here he's beginning to contrast the origin of sin with the death of sin. And if you have a subtitle in your Bible, it may say something like death in Adam and life in Christ. Verse 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, And so death spread to all men because all sinned. Sin came into the world because of Adam's disobedience. Because of this fall, all of humanity was marked with sin and separated from God. As a consequence, death came into the world. Before Adam's fall, there was no death. God had created humans to live forever with him. Verse 13. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. So Paul is discussing the time period between Adam and Moses, who was given the law. And as previously discussed, the law was given to show us what sin was and to reveal we needed a savior. Last time I spoke, I used the analogy of a doctor giving a terminal diagnosis to you and saying, if you don't take this medication, you will die. That's what the law did. But prior to the law between Adam and Moses, there was still death in the world. Verse 14. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who is a type of the one who was to come. Adam broke a command from God. That was his sin. He was told, do not eat of the fruit in the center of the garden. And he did that. God did not issue commands to the world again until the law came. 
So what Paul is saying, the sins of everyone after Adam, but before Moses, were different than Adam's sin. Because everyone after Adam was sinning because of Adam's sin, but not against a direct command from God, since it hadn't been given yet. Still, death, which is the consequence of sin, fell on everyone before the law came. Paul is saying that Adam was the type of one to come. He's referring to Jesus here. Now, type means model or reference or precursor, if you will. So, Paul is building his case that through one man, Adam, man was separated from God. Through Jesus, man is reunited with God. Both Adam and Jesus brought about great change. Adam brought about horrible, bad change, and Jesus brought about good and the most amazing change. Verse 15. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. Adam's sin or trespass affected everyone, even though they didn't intentionally decide to sin. Condemnation came to all. In contrast, Christ's free gift freed everyone who chose to accept it. Grace is better than condemnation. Verse 16. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For, the, for judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. So the result of that grace was justification, being made righteous with God. One trespass from Adam condemned us and created generations of sin. What Paul is saying is one sacrifice, Jesus, covered all of that trespass. It took a greater act to redeem man than it did to condemn man. Now notice that Paul keeps referring to Jesus' sacrifice as a free gift. It is free. There is no cost to us. Jesus paid it. But what must you do to receive a gift? You have to accept it. Until you accept it, it's just an offer. So imagine you apply for a job and they make you an offer. You cannot collect a paycheck until you accept the offer and become an employee. Verse 17. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Because of Adam's sin, death ruled over mankind. And fear of death is still one of man's greatest fears. But as Christians, we don't have to be afraid. Let's look at 2 Timothy 1.10. And which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Jesus ended death's reign. Because we are still living in a fallen world and haven't physically entered into God's kingdom, we still see death. As stated earlier, though, it is just one death. We only die once, not twice. As followers of Christ, we don't have to be afraid of death. Death becomes a doorway to God. And as we read earlier as well, God will throw death into the lake of fire at the end of ages. 1 Corinthians 15, 25, and 26. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. So death is the final enemy. Thanks be to God that we, through Jesus, are no longer enemies of God. That means we have life. Verse 18. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience there were many made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. So Paul is concluding this section by summarizing the points that he's been making. The actions of one, Adam, broke the design of what God had created and led to death. This was undone by the act of one, Jesus. And condemnation was lifted and a pathway to life revealed. 
Verse 20. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Now the law increased sin in the sense that it defined sin. It revealed what sin was and the depths of our sin. And it also defined the consequences of our sin. But even though sin increased, God's grace exponentially increased to cover it. Verse 21. So that as sin reigned in death, grace might also reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Death was removed from its throne, and grace now rules. Death is forever deposed, and grace rules eternally. And this is all through Christ Jesus. Because of him, death is defeated, and in him, eternal life reigns. Amen. Yes. So in review, Paul expounded on the fact that we are saved by faith and faith alone, not by works. But God was not content just to save us. He works in us to refine us, to make us better versions of ourselves, closer to what God envisioned us to be before we were born, more like Christ. God is with us in our suffering and uses it to give us patient perseverance with proven strength and trusted confidence that does not put us to shame. Even though the actions of one man in Adam messed everything up, Jesus put it all back together. Death has been defeated and we no longer need to fear it. Hebrews 9, 27 and 28. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. In this, we are full of hope because Jesus has taken care of sin, death, and judgment. Because he has paid our debt, we will not be judged like the world. And this verse promises us that he is coming back for us. John 14, 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and, take, and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Jesus is coming back to take us to be with him. His return is closer than we think. World events are lining up. The stage is being set for this chapter to end and God to start the new eternal one. Be encouraged, but also be alert. Ephesians 5.15. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. Making the best use of the time because the days are evil. As Christ followers, we must live wisely so we can represent God. We are God's ambassador. We are his hands and feet on earth. We want as many people as possible to accept Jesus and experience true life with the Lord. Remember our ultimate destination, to be with God. I'm going to invite the worship team to come out now. Remember our calling to make disciples of all nations and peoples. Have you ever been driving in an old car that's just speeding up and going faster and faster? The faster it goes, the louder it gets as the scenery blurs by the window. The world is racing towards God's conclusion. Don't be distracted by the rattling noises and flashing scenery. Stay focused on our destination and God's purpose. Lean into God and seek his will in these trying times. God is with you, and never forget he has a purpose for you. Now, we started this chapter with a verse talking about peace, so let's conclude with one as well. 2 Thessalonians 3.16. Now may the Lord of peace him, himself give you peace at all times, in every way. The Lord be with you all. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for just being with us in this hot auditorium speaking through me, Lord, and just allowing us to hear what you would say to us. We thank you so, so very much for your gift of grace and dying for us and redeeming us and sparing us from your wrath. Lord, thank you for justifying us. We just love you and we praise you and we're so, so grateful. 
And for anyone here who is not sure if they're covered under that grace or has never thought about it, but you want that peace, it's the easiest and freest, as Paul said repeatedly, decision you can make. All you have to do is recognize that you have a debt that you can't pay and accept Jesus' payment for it. All you have to do is say, yes, Lord, I need you. I accept your free gift. I want to be a part of your family. So I'm not going to ask anybody to stand up or do anything. If you, if you feel that way, simply pray that to God. And the only thing I would ask is you come up and get some prayer afterward because now that lion's going to be looking for you. So Lord, go with us all, be with everybody and give everyone a safe journey home and help us to hear your voice. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.